So I'm thinking that stories like today are sort of familiar to us discovery people, or the idea that Jesus welcomes outcasts maybe is not a totally new thing to discovery. Jesus welcomes outcasts. So that's a thing, but maybe we think, well, that's just part of the whole gospel story. It's one of many themes in the gospels that Jesus hung out with outcasts. And it's maybe one among many things. But let's take a closer look at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Jesus is walking along the shoreline doing his power walk teaching thing. And people are gathered and listening as he's teaching. But he stops his walk at an office, Levi's office, and he does what he's done before. He looks at somebody and says, follow me, and the person follows Jesus. Then it's kind of neat. I like where this story goes. In the next scene, the person that Jesus just called to and said, follow me, and he follows, invites Jesus over to the house for dinner. What's not to like about that? So great story, lots of fun, until we dig a little deeper and we listen to our cultural informants known as the scribes. If we don't get it as modern people reading stories, the scribes will clue us in. The scribes are not having it. Their hair is on fire. you got to be kidding me. You know, on the plus side, maybe the scribes are seeing Jesus as one of them. And if Jesus is one of them, then Jesus must think and act like them, you know, religious elites. So the scribes clue us in, wait a minute, this guy, Levi, is no fisher person. He is a tax collector. Now, tax collecting. So... Of course, all people from all places and times are not fond of having taxes collected from them. So that's a thing. So nobody likes, you know, to give up money, even if it's for something good sometimes. So that's a thing. But then in addition to that, in this ancient world religious context, the tax collectors were seen as outcasts religiously. Maybe it's because they dealt with the Roman government who are not religious types. Maybe they dealt with lots of different people from lots of different walks of life. Or perhaps it could be, and I'm indebted to biblical scholar Phyllis Carter for this term, it could be that they were scammers, right? She had a great word this week for tax collectors. How do you feel? about scammers. So for a variety of reasons, the tax collectors were not seen as part of religious society. They were outcasts. So Jesus crossed a social religious barrier in talking to Levi, number one, but he didn't just talk to Levi. He said to Levi, and he didn't say, oh, sinner or anything like that. He said, follow me. So Jesus reached out to Levi um, with the greatest invitation there is to become a follower, which Levi does, to his credit. And then we stub our toe upon another big ancient world thing, table fellowship. So it's not just interacting with tax collectors. It's actually going to someone's house and sharing a meal. (gasps) Horrors. So things around socializing and food are, were even a bigger deal in the ancient world. You know, who you were associating with, what food you were eating. We see a lot of this, say, in the book of Acts, too. There's a lot of controversy in the early church. You know, you could say early church culture wars, a lot of them around food and traditions. But there's Jesus sitting at Levi's table, 
And not only that, and I love how the Gospel of Mark lays it on thick. At Levi's house, there were many tax collectors and sinners. Many. There were many of them. For lots of them were following Jesus. So, if there's any part of our minds that think Jesus hung out with outcasts was just this tiny little thread of the Bible or one little theme of the Bible, let's correct our mindset. These outcasts were core to who Jesus was and how he operated. It's a really, really big deal. And we're only in Mark chapter 2. So it seems that Mark is like really, really, really underscoring Jesus, um, cent the centrality of Jesus' ministry connected to people who were deemed by the religious authorities as outcasts, as sinners, as, you know, keep them at arm length, arm's length. And Jesus was completely the opposite. He didn't just throw them a bone and say, look how merciful am I hanging out with these sinners, which could be implied by something that he says to the questioners. Jesus is signaling a lot more in his contact with them. So already we can conclude a couple of things. One, that Jesus hanging out with outcasts was normative for him. And the second thing that we can conclude is it was perceived as subversive. Jesus' normalness was seen as subversiveness by the religious people in the know. Wow. So what do you make of things when God's normal is seen as oh, outside the pale by people with power in society? And that's a tension that now will be part of the whole gospel lessons. And it's in every single gospel. And it makes me think that maybe that's one of the giant themes of all the gospels, is God's norm and human beings' reluctance to embrace that norm. Maybe initially there's curiosity, there's openness, but eventually there's a feeling of being threatened. And then there's a phase of utter backlash that Jesus needs to be shut down. And that's what happens on the cross. Everybody turns against Jesus. But then God's clue to us is, even with change, and change can be seen as subversive and creating pain and challenge, hang in there. There will be backlash. Keep the faith. Just because something is painful or uncomfortable does not mean it's not of God. Hang in there. Big theme of the Bible. You know, independent of this study this week, I was doing a little research, and I came across an interesting statistic. In the U.S., um, from 1845 to 1854, about eight years, the East Coast experienced a huge influx of immigrants from one country. And in that eight years, the number of immigrants from just one country was greater than the number of immigrants from the previous 64 years. So 64 years from 1776 to 1853, there was a certain number of people who came from a variety of different countries, and that was one number. But that number was blown out of the water in that one eight-year span of time uh, with people from one country. And how did the U.S. deal with that? Well, read history from that era and shortly thereafter. It was not pretty. 
the Irish were demonized. Hard to believe that today, isn't it? It just gets us thinking, like, what's going on in human heads, in human society, maybe religion itself, that makes us see other people in a different light? Change. Change is hard sometimes. You know, I'm thinking and thinking about change. The first place I go is not change is hard. That is not my first place I go. The first place I go is change is normal. It's normal. You know, that is just part of life. Change is part of life. It can be good or not so good or indifferent. I was thinking for we Midwesterners, man, I'm embracing change this weekend. You liking the weather, the change in the weather? I kind of like that. But another place change can go is individually. A change could be a bad one. But we, maybe we are called to think a little bit more broadly. How does a change impact a wider range of people? Change could impact you one way, and it could impact other people in a completely different way. And that bounces me back into the text again. Why did Jesus hang out in particular with outcasts and sinners? Maybe they were the ones most ready for change. Maybe they were the ones most ready for change. Jesus goes on in this story, throwing in several different quotes to help the scribes understand what was going on. Jesus likens himself to a groom who's only around for a short time, so eat up like you're at a feast. Jesus likens himself to a new piece of cloth that you would never sew onto an old piece of cloth that would just tear things away. Jesus likens himself to new wine that you would never put in an old wineskin. If you put new wine in an old wineskin, the old wineskin would already be stretched and you put the new wine in there, it wouldn't have any more room to stretch. And so that wine skin, that container that they used, would tear and break, and you'd lose the container as well as the wine itself. Jesus is new cloth. Jesus is new wine. Jesus is something entirely new, and with something new, with a change, this is what hit me. When you have one change, you need a second change. One big change means a second change. And that second change is where we can often derail. Because that second change change will cause discomfort to some, celebration perhaps for others. And so it is a process. You know, Tony, our tech, one of our wonderful tech people, has a little joke that he makes off and on. He, he, well, he was kind of quoting something else, but he'll say, we're the quirky church. We're the quirky church. And then if he sees me, you know how he greets me? How's the quirky pastor today? How's the quirky pastor today? So, you know, we have kind of a reputation here at Discovery Presbyterian Church of being open to change, of trying new things. And... That is seen as not normative 
for church. Now, isn't that just kind of mind-blowing, given our text today? That churches doing something new is unusual. I find that kind of disturbing. And I wonder if we can more heartily embrace the normal of thinking differently, of being open to change, and doing new things. Not because we're trying to get attention or we're trying to do something different. It's because it's gospel. It's normal. It's normal. And modeling this, you know, centers us with Jesus Christ. And it doesn't always mean that it's going to be easy. Man, following him and embracing his norm, oof, it's challenging, it's uncomfortable. A little story from this week, reading the text, Matt, who comes to Friday Bible study, said, oh, I remember one time when I sat in a different pew in his church. It messed up his entire day. You know, and maybe our response is, so? That sounds kind of mean. You know, Jesus isn't here to make us comfortable. Jesus is here to stretch us. You know, and how are we stretched to be that container, that new wine that welcomes the experience of God, the true experience of God, like people who are outside and ready to experience that and not be threatened by people on the inside or people who are comfortable who may say, this is going to hurt, you're not going to like it. Yeah, you're right. It won't be comfortable. But it's faithful. This is what faithfulness feels like and looks like. This is normal for us. You know, another ex example that came to mind was actually from our new member class. At the end of our class, we had a really good discussion. And I was quizzing them because I know that one part of discovery um, has people from who happen to live in Papillion. And so, you know, I just had it in my brain, like, how do we develop Papillion, you know, making more connections? It's, since we're right on the county line, we're in South Omaha, you know, how, how do we build bridges there? But a very wise voice in that member class said, it's, and I'm changing the words, it's really not about zip code. It's that discovery is inclusive. And that is just good news regionally. Discovery embraces change. Discovery knows how to reset tables. That's our market, so to speak. That's the big container that we're a part of. And we got into a really wonderful, fruitful discussion about inclusive. One place you go with inclusive in our times is LGBTQ inclusion. That's often the first thing that comes to mind. Yes, and. Someone else pointed out, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, Discovery Presbyterian Church has a female pastor. I don't know whether the word's gotten out about that. But that right there, having a female pastor, sends a signal regionally, about who we are. Yes, and. And how are we, you know, embracing neural diversions, people that um, embrace the world, experience the world in different ways? How are we inclusive, people who see and hear and move? It's a big topic. How do we grow in our relationship with the Sudanese and the Spanish-speaking group within our walls and beyond? It's a big topic. It's painful. It's almost too large. How to do this? Well, this new thing that is normative for Jesus, it's something that we learn in change. And I thought the biggest tool in our toolbox 
of embracing change, whether it's personally or corporately, anywhere, is agile thinking. And the more I thought about agile thinking, you know, just having a, a container for the experience of God in new ways, to me, agile thinking is another way of saying prayerful. Old, ancient thing, isn't it? Being prayerful. Being prayerful is not rubbing a lantern and getting our own way. Prayerful is saying, Lord, let your vision be our vision. Prayerful is, Lord, let your kingdom come. It's about God's way. God's way. And when we have clarity on God's way, wow, what an aha, God provides us the tools to figure it out and not blame somebody or uh, close down or go back because it's too painful. We've been given agility in a prayerful outlook that makes us creative. Rearranging tables, digging through roofs, which we know Jesus says, that's faithfulness. That's faithfulness. May we all grow with the power of the Spirit in our faithfulness. To God be the glory. Amen.